It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Radio and realagriculture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Monday edition of the show. Hey, thanks so much, everybody, for making Real Ag Radio and Rural Radio 147 a big part of your workday. Also, a big shout out to re listening out there on the Real Ag Radio podcast. It is great to be with you here today. It is the last Monday of June. And uh, yeah, this time next week we'll be uh, in Canada Day mode. <laughs> Boy, the year is just, it is absolutely flying by. Hey, hope you had yourself a great weekend. I definitely did. As I mentioned last week, on Friday night, had a great time. I drove out to Foremost, Alberta. It's, yeah, it's about an hour and. 15 or something like that minutes from from Lethbridge and uh, kind of at the bottom of the triangle between Medicine Hat and, and an inverted triangle between Lethbridge and Medicine Hat crops look great out that way that's for sure um, can be a very very traditional area and I was invited to be the the guest speaker at uh, the graduation and it was it was fabulous we had oh, great time I, I, so I, I uh, went to the, for the supper, which was great. And then, uh, there was eight graduates. Yes. So definitely small town had, uh, well, first of all, met a, a ton of listeners of this show, fans of real com. People been, you know, using the website and our YouTube channel for years. Also, uh, people listening to this show, uh, uh, ran into a farmer that I have not seen for quite some time and talked about how, you know, listens to this show every day, really appreciates the content and the discussion and the learning and all that. It just absolutely warms my heart. It was, it was pretty cool. Had a great time. It, it was, it was really interesting because, you know, in a, in a, in a town like that, and there's many of them across Canada and the U S where agriculture is just like, it is the thing. It's it's the glue. It what it what it, it's just totally what connects the entire community. Amazing stuff. They had, like I said, eight graduates. Three of the eight kids going to the U.S. on rodeo scholarships. So you know that Western lifestyle definitely a part of that community. But it, I I had such a great time. It, it was fabulous. I really appreciate Sean Hardy inviting me and and Connor. Um, who, who was graduating, really, really do appreciate you uh, having me out on Friday night. Great way to spend Friday. I had to get out of there <laughs> because you, you know when you're like, okay, if I don't leave now, I'm going to be looking for to have a sleepover somewhere because I can't drive home. So, yeah, I, I was really enjoying myself and really, really taking in the conversation and really, really enjoying it. But, uh, yeah, great night on Friday night. And, uh, yeah, we're into another week, and let's uh, let's get into it. So, Today on uh, the show, it is Agronomic Monday. We are going to be hearing from Clint Yerke with Canola Council of Canada about early early season scouting of canola. And I know that uh, we've definitely got some moisture out there in some parts. And this week, the heat is finally going to be turned up a little bit. Here, here in Lethbridge, it actually finally, 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 finally felt like maybe summer. Some summer-like conditions, which was whoa, so nice. We're also going to hear from Horse Bonner with Omafra. Talk about managing late planted soybeans. Peter Johnson will be with us here today to talk about a number of different agricultural issues. And then we're going to hear from Megan Reed with the Saskatchewan Pulse Growers to talk about you know, this question. Is it a Phenomyces? We've got more moisture in the soil. It has been cool. you got to think that this is going to be a thriving environment for a Phenomyces this year in 2024. So we'll hear from Megan on that. Hey, if you have any feedback on today's show, we'd love to hear from you. Send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also find us across all the different social media platforms. Remember, tonight on our YouTube channel, Real Agriculture's YouTube channel, we got The Agronomist. It's going to be a great show and uh, hosted by Lindsay Smith. Actually, I'm the producer tonight, which I'm really looking forward to. Love being the producer for that show. Jay Strobe is taking the uh, Monday off. And uh, I'll be being the producer tonight with Lindsay. So we're looking for, we'll be tag teaming it. She'll be the host. I'll be the producer. 
Uh, great conversation. You can get CCA and CEU credits for participating in the Agronomous. 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Central. So please check it out tonight while you're watching the hockey game, maybe. You have two dual screens up. We also have a College World Series tonight, Game 3, the final. So we got a lot of we got stuff to do tonight. we got the Agronomous College World Series for baseball. And then, of course, we got the Oilers-Panthers game as, as well. You can also call the Real Ag Feedback Line. That number is 855-776-6147. Okay, let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to hear from Clint Yerke, the Canola Council of Canada. We're talking about, like, you got to get out in those fields of your canola and scout, 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 scout. We'll get to that when we come back. You're listening to Real Ag Radio, Rural Radio 147. Choose Viatude Fungicide and unleash best-in-class sclerotinia protection in canola and premium protection against white mold in soybeans. Viatude contains a powerful premix of Onmira Active and Prothiaconazole. This unique combo delivers high-performance disease control, crop safety, mix compatibility, resistance management, and advanced mobility for excellent coverage and superior plant protection. Choose Viatude Fungicide for stronger, more vigorous crops. I get to spend every day talking to farmers in the ag industry through realagriculture.com and Real Ag Radio. But nothing is more fun than speaking to an audience live and in person. If you're planning an ag event, book a Real Agriculture speaker to make it a successful and memorable experience. Email shaney at realagriculture.com and you can book myself or any other Real Ag personality to speak at your event. Bring your audience all the fun, insight, and energy of Real Agriculture. Peter Johnson at WeekPeak, RealAgriculture.com, and what an opportunity! Oh my gosh! You think you can't grow better wheat? You are absolutely wrong. We're going to show you how to strive for those record wheat yields that they get in the UK and in New Zealand. You can grow 150 bushel wheat. I'll show you how. Catch Wheat Beats Word every Wednesday on RealAgriculture.com or download the podcast on iTunes or Spotify. Make sure on Real Agriculture, you always check out the Canola School. It is brought to you by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. You can go to canolaschool.com to find all the great episodes. Also, our Real Agriculture YouTube channel as well. Well, Alberta field editor Amber Bell was out and about in uh, the fields the past couple weeks, and she had a chance to catch up with Clint Yerke from the Canola Council of Canada to talk about the power and the impact of early scouting of that canola crop. I'm here today with Clint Yerke, who is the Agronomy Director with the Canola Council of Canada. And we're going to be talking about early scouting in canola and why you should be out there doing it. So, welcome Clint, it's great to have you. Oh, thank you. I love being in the field, so this is a great opportunity to hang out with you and all you fine folks. Yeah, and the rain slowed down. And we got a break in the clouds, yeah, <laughs> so it's even better. Awesome. So we're going to talk about early scouting. Yep. Now, why don't we get right in? How early should we be going out and scouting? Well, as, as early as possible. Um, usually, with warmer soils, it takes uh, the canola crop six, seven days to start poking through the ground, really depending upon your, your seeding depth. Uh, 10 days, two weeks is probably the, the best window of opportunity in which to, to uh, take a close look at what's happening in the field. So um, not long after seeding. So when you wrap up your seeding operation, you don't have a lot of time to go to the lake and that, unfortunately. You've got to be back out in the field looking to see how things are go coming along. And coming from a cattle background, you know, that completely ruins all my notions that the crop guys have it easy. <laughs> Thinking once seeding's done, they're good. Yeah, no, I, I wish it was like that. And it seems like we spend more and more time on the sprayer every year. And so uh, asking them the dead of winter, it's probably not a bad time to be a crop guy. That's but true. Uh, That's yeah, true. not. <laughs> not uh, not during growing season, unfortunately. So during that growing season, what should producers be looking for? What should they be scouting for? So there's two major things that you really want to look for when um, when you're you're getting out to first look at your canola crop. Number one is to uh, measure the success of of your seeding operation. Like how well did you actually establish that crop? How many of those plants are actually coming up out of the ground? And number two is to start looking for problems because. Unfortunately, Mother Nature is going to throw a, a wrench in, in, the, uh, 
in, in your operation in some way. And so the better that you can catch that at the beginning, the, the better you're going to be able to manage it. So looking at the seating operation and, and then scouting for pests or any kind of issues. Okay, and what can you go into what some of those issues might be and what you'd be looking for as signs and symptoms? Yeah, so um, environmental issues, uh, weeds, diseases, insects, these are all going to have a, an impact upon your, your plant stand and ultimately your yield at the end of the season and ultimately your profitability. So the, uh, the sooner that you can uh, get a handle for any of these things. Um, really the, the weather events that, that we're most interested in are frosts. Early, uh, late season frosts are the, the biggest factor and, and this year is no exception. We have seen some, uh, some farmers that have had some issues in parts of Alberta where they have had cold temperatures and so that has a big impact upon uh, your, your plant stand. Flea beetles uh, for, for the insect side are the, the number one uh, insect that we're concerned at this time of year and, and often when we ask farmers like what is the biggest pest that you're most concerned about? Flea beetles is always at the top of the list, higher than any disease or, or weed or anything. So uh, watching for flea beetles and, and uh, ensuring that there isn't any damage. And once those damages start climbing, then trying to uh, decide when is the best time to pull that, the trigger on, on uh, getting in the field with a, with a foliar insecticide. Mm -hmm. And on the weed side, uh, it is early um, to, to assess how, how good your uh, weed control is, obviously, um, but you could certainly look for escapes from, uh, from your pre-seed burn, um, and particularly uh, looking for um, any weeds that are on the herbicide resistant spectrum. Uh, glyphosate resistant kochia is, is the big one right now, and, and if you are only using uh, uh, glyphosate in your pre-seed burn, yeah, now is a good time to to start looking for for when the when the kochia starts appearing. So those those are the issues that you're you primarily want to be looking for and um, making a decision as to when you need to get into the field with your first herbicide application as, as well as is what you should be trying to decide on as well in your first. Right. Scouts. And then you mentioned diseases. Is there anything you can watch for this early in the season with diseases? Yeah. Yeah. So. Say you, you, you seed your crop, uh, maybe it's early, early May, and uh, two weeks later, you're still not seeing very many plants. Maybe there's the odd plant that's, that's coming up. If it's cold and wet, um, that's actually not a, a great scenario for, for emerging canola crop. Cold, wet soils usually mean higher activity of, of some of the soil pathogens. Pythium is, is the big one that really likes cold, wet soils. And it's gonna do everything that it can to uh, start infecting those uh, germinating seeds. Um, canola seed is treated and it does provide good, uh, uh, good efficacy against a lot of these soil pathogens, but the longer that that seed sits in the soil, um, unemerged, like what, once the plant gets above the, the soil surface and starts photosynthesizing, it gets a lot of energy to fight off any of those uh, root pathogens, but before then, it's, it's really vulnerable. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, th and this is one of the things that we often see, particularly with uh, uh, situations where the seed might have got seeded a little deeper than a grower likes. We, we like to target that three quarters of an inch, but sometimes seed might wind up down two inches, three inches even. It takes a long time for that hypocotyl, the, the, that growing stem, to get above the, the soil surface and a lot of opportunity for pathogens to attack it. So two weeks after seeding, take a look. And if you're not finding any, uh, any plants, then get your trowel out and start doing some digging and see what's happening. Uh, if it's just that the, the seed is almost at the soil surface, then you still might be okay. But if you're starting to see like uh, remnants of, of seedlings that haven't mm. come up, then, then you know you might have a, a seed, uh, seed disease issue. And what would you do in that scenario? Would that be the time to start thinking about a fungicide or? Well, unfortunately you can't rescue a seedling disease uh, with, with fungicides. Um, uh, wish we could. It's it's a little bit of a wait and see. Like uh, probably want to wait another week and just see how many of those those plants still might make it. Um, usually, once the root or that hypocotyl is is infected, there's it's kind of game over for for those plants. But maybe some of the brothers and sisters that are in that seed are row gonna are going to be fine, right? And then they'll they'll fill in. So that's where you you need to have is is a is some type of tool for for counting plants and 
try to get an assessment for how many of those, uh, how many plants that you're going to wind up with. Once you start getting below two plants per square foot, um, it, that crop becomes more difficult to manage once you're below one plant per square foot. So the, uh, the decision you really need to make is, is whether or not to go in and reseed. Right. Yeah. Would there be any opportunity for interseeding at that point or putting in something else on top of the canola? So like cover crop or yeah. uh, multi-crop uh, type of planting? I don't know. Actually, okay. yeah, there, there, too, yeah, there's there's not a lot of uh, data that's that's looked at intercropping and its role on seedling diseases that I'm aware of, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, Lana Shaw would be a great person to talk to about that. Yeah. So, <laughs> I've been in the but, regenerative yeah. world for too long. I write yeah. and I'm like, hey, that would be a good solution. Yeah, the 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 best scenario is is getting that canola crop up and out of the ground as as quickly okay, as possible. Else, yeah, so like. That's why we recommend like that really shallow depth because mm -hmm. the quicker that it can get up and start photosynthesizing then your uh, a lot of the problems are, are going to disappear especially with with seedling diseases. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention about early scouting, the importance of it? Yeah, yeah. So I'll go back to uh, to this ring. It's it's really important to do plant counts uh, early season. Um, I know that a lot of producers are seeding by weight, so five pounds per acre, four and a half pounds per acre, uh, maybe some are even higher than that. But what we what we want at the end of the season, we want anywhere from five to seven plants per square foot, because that's our best opportunity for maximizing our yield. If you're below five plants per square foot, you're likely putting yourself at risk for losing yield. Uh, above seven plants, well, then you start getting interplant competition and potentially could uh, have an impact on yield. So, when you are seeding, um, seed is really expensive, right? I don't have to tell anybody <laughs> that. But on average, most farmers are putting two seeds in the ground just to get one plant. Mm. So, that's 50% of that seed investment is potentially wasted. But we do know that, that there are some producers that are routinely getting 80% of their, their plants. Uh, or seeds becoming plants and then at the other end of the spectrum there's some that might be routinely getting 30 to 40 percent only so it'd be nice if we can get everyone to that 80 percent but when we ask uh, a lot of farmers as to what is your emergence rate like what is the the survivability of of, of your seed and becoming plants a lot of farmers actually don't have hard numbers they mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's just going by gut feel so Quantifying it is, is really important because now we can actually say, hey, I, I actually did get five plants, that was my target, and uh, now I know exactly how many seeds didn't make it. And when you know how many seeds don't make it, then you can start considering, okay, well, what do I need to do to improve that? Is it uh, my seeding depth? Uh, is it, the, um, is it the, the drill itself? Like, do I need to consider maybe a different opener? Is it due to uh, residue that's in the field? Uh, was it just even the the fact that I seeded into cold soils and so right. a number of those seeds just didn't make it uh, due to that. So having a, an understanding of of why those seeds actually didn't come up is going to really help out with uh, planning for future success so that you can go from maybe being a 50% a emergence to an 80% emergence as, as a rule. And when you know that you're an 80% emergence, well, then you don't need to buy quite as good. much seed, right? Yeah. And so, and so I'm guessing if you're doing that year after year, you're going to yeah. have a much better handle on what exactly is the reason behind it, right? Yes. You yep. know, oh, well, yeah. I always get this. Yeah. Okay, there was a drought this year. Yeah. Um, Data is power. The, the, right. the better numbers that you have, uh, the better you're, you're going to do into the long term. Right. Yeah. Okay, and so you have that fancy Frisbee. Yeah. Um, is... Uh, <laughs> I'll get the fancy Frisbee. Okay, the fancy yeah. Frisbee. Yeah. So is... This a square in a circle. <laughs> <laughs> this circle has been squared. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> the, this particular circle is is uh, two square feet exactly. So um, the the nice thing about having uh, one like this is that it does fly a little bit, and so you do get a random placement. Uh, I know that back in the old days when I would go out and scout fields, we would just walk out into the field and put your feet out and try counting the number of of uh, plants between your feet. It's bias usually comes in. We so, have our human bias. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So having something that's going to eliminate that bias is, is going to give you better numbers Great. in the end. And um, 
And there are a number of tools that are available. Uh, we have some at the Canola Council uh, on our Canola Calculator website um, where you can enter the numbers of, of what, whatever plant counts that you get. And with those numbers, uh, if you have your seeding rate and your, your thousand seed weight, it'll tell you exactly what your, what your emergence rate is, what your survivability is. And so that, those numbers can certainly aid you. I, I'm sure that there are other tools out there that uh, growers can access as well. But uh, um, make use of, of the tools that you have and mm -hmm. you'll sure have good and keep success. keep data. Yes, keep your right. data. Yep. That was Amber Bell of Real Agriculture out in the boat with uh, Clint Yerke from the Canole Council of Canada. We'll be right back here on Real Ag Radio on Agronomic Monday right after this. If you're involved in the agriculture industry, it's important to stay informed on all the latest issues affecting your business. At realagriculture.com, we offer fast, reliable news, information, and insights to help you keep on top of all of the latest in Canadian agriculture. Visit realagriculture.com and sign up for our free daily newsletter covering everything from news, agronomy, animal agriculture, and much more. Visit realagriculture.com forward slash subscribe today. Canola is more than just a pretty face in the prairie landscape. It's a big business, both here and around the world, that requires you to be informed and up-to-date on everything it takes to grow a successful crop. The Canola School on realagriculture.com has an expert library of video resources covering markets, agronomy, and more to help you grow a healthy and profitable canola crop. Visit canolaschool.com today. Brought to you by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. It's summertime, and you've got a lot of important decisions to make when it comes to your corn crop. Let the Corn School on realagriculture.com help guide you through those big decisions with input from leading experts in the field. If it's spray timing, disease identification, or any other field issue, the Corn School's got you covered. The Corn School on realagriculture.com, brought to you by BASF and Pride Seeds. Culture Soybean School brought to you by Syngenta Canada and BSF Canada. You can find episodes by going to soybeanschool.com. On a recent episode, Bern Tobin caught up with Ontario soybean specialist Horst Bonner to talk about, okay, it, we've had some, some wet areas in Ontario, of course. That, that's no new news. But some of the beans are getting in late. And are there things that we need to do to make sure that we're, we're properly managing some of those later than we would have liked planted soybeans? Here's Horst Bonner and Bern Tobin. Great to be out with you in your plots here. We're going to talk about these plots in a minute, but let's talk about planting soybeans. Um, June 20th, yeah. um, <sighs> growers are still planting soybeans. Yeah, um, it's yeah. been a struggle. It you know, how do you assess this year? Well, it really is something when you think back to April and we were talking about how early should we go. And here we are, almost yeah. July. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, for sure, tough spring, especially on heavy clay soils and some pockets in Lambton still really trying. Yeah. And further north, too, we're really hopeful that this week we'll let those, let those people get the job done. And so, you know, I think the question is, how can we make some recommendations yeah. for those guys? Exactly. So let's, let's start with potential. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, mm -hmm. and, and recommendations. Um, you're planting those soybeans late, the 15th, the 10th of June, and as you say, maybe some more to come. Um, how much potential do we have left? Well, I think it, the good news is we still have a lot of potential left. That's the incredible thing about soybeans. Our work would show still up to 90% of total yield is there. Now, of course, of what, right? Is it of 60 bushel? Well, it, de it depends, or of 70 bushel total potential, because that really depends on August. So what I'm saying is, you might still be able to get 45, 50, 55 bushels, even planting today, um, if the rest of the season is great. But we have lost potential, yeah. which is what you're getting at. So you've got some, some great plots here, and you've just pulled out a few plants, and uh, let's talk nodes. Yeah, exactly. So this trial here is in cooperation with Mazex Seed, so they seeded this for us. That's great, and we're going to seed again here this week as a second planting date. Now, to compare the, uh, those two dates, let's look at this little plant I just pulled out, and look at the number of nodes where the seed, of course, and the pods hang, 
that we're missing if we plant mm -hmm. today versus this little plant. One, two, three, four, five nodes, right? Now, often the, the very uh, first one here on the cotyledons don't produce much yield anyway, but four to five nodes and they're gone. Right. So what I'm saying is when the, when the new ones come out of the ground now very quickly, right, they'll shoot out with all this heat. They still cannot catch up on those five nodes. And remember, we only have about 25 nodes to begin with. Yeah. Right. And so that's uh, the yield loss that we just cannot can entirely catch yeah. up on. Right. Let's talk about what growers can have been doing and can do as they continue to plant, um, sort of, sort of to mitigate that loss of season. Right. Um, kind of starts with uh, with variety selection. Well, and that's a good point that you bring up there because, of course, intuitively we want to shorten up our maturity selection so that they finish nicely in the mm -hmm. fall. Right. Here's the problem: if you shorten up the maturity, you also reduce yield. And we have very good evidence that it's about five bushels, mm. right? If you pull back a full maturity group. And if you don't pull back a full maturity group, then it's almost not worth doing. It's only just a couple of days. Like a full maturity group, if you move from a 2.0 to a 1.0, if you plant those in May, that's about 10 days difference. If you plant them now, it's probably only about seven, seven. six, seven mm. days. And that's the problem. We don't want to give up on those five bushels. So we say stick with your adapted variety right till the crop insurance deadline for maximum yield potential. Now, will they come off on the 1st mm -hmm. of October? We'll wait no. and see. No, no, they won't is my point. Oh, yeah. They'll still be later. They'll still be a bit later, right? But not as late as you'd think. You know, there's that kind of three to one relationship we use. Uh, each three week later um, it, that you seed them is only a one week later in harvest, mm -hmm. right? What about row widths? Yeah, very important point. You're, you're right on. If I had a 15 inch row unit planter, as I do, and I was seeding today, I would whip around back and make it a 15, or rather a seven and a half mm -hmm. inch final spacing, because that does make a difference. Yeah. Uh, no question, you want seven and a half yeah. now uh, in it, Ontario. And that's going to impact your, your populations. Well, that's right. You want to maximize the number of, remember how we were just talking about those nodes, maximize the number of nodes per acre now. And the way you do that is you up the population. And because the, 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 the plants are physically shorter when they're planted later, an acre can take more plants. Yep. So you want to up it. We say at the beginning of June by 10%. And now I would almost say near the end of June, you can almost go another 10%. Mm -hmm. Now it depends where you've started, yeah. right? I mean, if you've started at 225, 10% is lots, but if you started at 140, yeah, there's no problem going up 20%. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's talk about um, feeding the crop. Um, we've, we've, you've done a lot of work on nitrogen. Is there anything there for growers? In a late planting scenario, there may be a little more benefit to just a little bit of nitrogen fertilizer, right? As, and, and the whole idea, again, is to close, close that row quicker. So um, it's a tricky one, for sure. And that is one of the treatments here. In this trial, typically we get about two bushels, but for late planting, especially if you don't get a perfect stand, a little bit of nitrogen mm -hmm. can go a long way. And on top of that, P and K, yeah. I get that question sometime. It's going to be Some, my next question. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. No, but, but P and K, um, what about uptake throughout the season? Do we, can we do anything there? Well, yeah, that's right, because if you put down fertilizer now, you know, is it too late before it becomes available? And amazingly enough, soybeans are so hungry for K that if the ground is deficient and you put it on now, we still get a response, right? Yeah. E even a little bit later, even almost until flowering, Surface applied, believe it or not, if the soil test is low, we still get a nice response. Yeah. So I'm, I'm still in favor of feeding beans, even at this stage, if the soil test yeah. calls for it. Yeah. Well, what I know and what you know um, is that uh, getting beans in the ground, they always tend to surprise. Uh, and yes. if we get the right conditions here, I think growers will do all right. Well, I, no, I think the positive message is we've been here before. We have planted right to the crop insurance deadline and often we're surprised in a good way yeah. of the final yield potential. So let's get the job done and 
hope the rest of the season mm -hmm. is beautiful. Great stuff, Horace. Always good to have yeah, you on the Soybean good. School. You can find more episodes like this by going to soybeanschool.com or checking out the Real Agriculture YouTube channel. You know, interesting. Horse believes even at this late planted date, we, we still got 90% of our possible yield out in the field. Of, of course, though, Mother Nature does need to to cooperate. Great information there from Bern Tobin and Horse Bonner, who is the soybean specialist in Ontario. Okay, when we come back on Real Ag Radio, we're going to continue with our focus on agronomics today, like we always do on Mondays. We'll be joined by Peter Wee P. Johnson right after this. If you only listen to Real Ag Radio, you only get half the picture. For greater insight into the issues that affect farming, tune in to realagriculture.com. Crops, livestock, machinery, farm management and the markets, even food and travel. Real Agriculture Online digs deeper into the topics that affect the way you work and live. So get connected today. Read, watch and listen to the people who know at realagriculture.com. Infuse some energy into your next corporate event, customer meeting, or conference with Real Ag Radio, Canada's national agriculture radio show. Create a unique experience at your next event with host Sean Haney, broadcasting Real Ag Radio live on Sirius XM, featuring exciting guests, captivating interviews, and the latest news from the agriculture community. Contact advertising at realagriculture.com or call 587 787 1795 to book your on location with Real Ag Radio today. And welcome back to Real Ag Radio here on this Monday. We are joined right now. He is out in the field scouting, scouting, scouting. It is the thing to do these days. It is Peter WP Johnson. Hey, Pete, how's it going? Sean, the sun is shining. The heat has, has gone for the time in Ontario. So we're back into wheat. Temperatures last week was just brutal on the wheat crop. But I just, I, I know we lost yield. I talked to one grower, his oats were pollinating. Uh, Tyler at, at near uh, Hamilton, uh, Brantford area, he, he guesses or he estimates that 20% of his oat florets, he had a tremendous crop. 20% of those oat floors blasted in the heat last week. So like a 20% hit. Now, they can come back with test weight a little bit. But uh, no, we're back into wheat weather. She's 22 degrees today, baby. Go wheat. <laughs> wheat for the win. In your, uh, you, you, you're going to get able to get all that work done today so you can get home and watch the hockey game tonight? Uh, go Oilers, 100%, man. Uh, <laughs> I know you're not always an Oilers fan, but boy, I... I sure hope they bring it home. I hope they they are you know in the in the record books for this one. So I will do my best to get home by dark and at least catch the last period. Pizarium really showing itself in its ugly face in in some of this wheat crop in Ontario. So Sean, we were on the cereal crop committee tour last week for the southern site. So that's Woodsley, Ridgetown, Inwood, Centralia. When we were at Woodsley, so that's the furthest south, really interesting because the early maturing wheat varieties were pretty good. They had some fusarium, but not that you'd say, oh, my gosh, the later maturing varieties. So, you know, we're talking about a week difference in, in flowering date, and that's when fusarium infects. They were just hammered like like almost as bad as 1996. A lot of people won't remember 1996, but me being an old guy, I was around then, and 90% of the Ontario wheat crop was downgraded to feed, sample, or totally rejected. There was actually wheat at over 70 parts per million toxin that year, dawn in the, in the grain. Some of it was dumped in the bush. Uh, boy, where it's bad, it is very bad. We went to Ridgetown, and everything was hit there. Now, the fungicides, absolutely doing their job. They're suppression, so they're not perfect, but there was visibly less fusarium in the fungicide-treated strips at Ridgetown than there was where they did not use the T3 fungicide, so that's good news. But even where we sprayed fungicides, such high pressure there... It's just a really high-pressure year. 
and there was way more fusarium in the crop than I would like. So mm. uh, what can a grower do, right? That's the real question. And, and the answer is pretty simple. You've got to harvest as early as you can, and you have to keep as much wind blast as you can on, on the combine because you can blow the lighter fusarium infected kernels out the back. We used to say maximum wind. Some of these new combines, if you go to maximum wind, they can actually blow everything out the back. So I can't say that anymore. But you just have to use separation as much as you can. And the other really interesting piece of information, Dave Hooker t- tweeted out some, some information about lodged wheat. And with all the torrential downpours we had last week, Sean, there is so much lodged wheat. Uh, like it just a lot of crop that was standing has gone down when you get lodged wheat the dawn concentrations the toxin concentrations in the lodged wheat go up dramatically faster mm-hmm. than in wheat that's standing and, and it's a humidity thing right we're down on the ground now and it just stays damp and wet and it doesn't dry out and anytime wheat is over 19 percent, we are making more toxin in fusarium infected uh, grain and so 30 to 50%, if I remember correctly, more toxin in the lodged wheat than in the wheat that did not lodge. So number one, growers need to get out and, and scout and figure out which you know fields are most affected because timing of heading does matter this year. So you know, look, look at your early planted, your early, short season wheats versus your longer season, late planted wheats, figure out where it's bad, figure out where it's lodged, have the combine ready combine as soon as you can and dry the crop don't wait for it to get to 13.5 moisture because one more rain and the toxin levels just keep going up i got another thing i want to chat with you about and and that's the around side dressing of corn and research out there in terms of the type of nitrogen we're using has a big impact on loss at this time. So let's run through some of these numbers because there's big differences. I couldn't believe it, Sean. So this this is in the Pioneer Agra Insights or Highlights or whatever their their magazine is. It's a Corteva study, but they used a a vast majority of of the data was actually from Josh Naselski, Dave Hooker here in, uh, in Ontario, University of Guelph, three sites, Ridgetown, Alora, and Winchester, and they looked at urea and UAN. So urea, ammonium nitrate, liquid nitrogen, we call it 28%. If it's undiluted, we call it 32%. But we generally would say, well, the UAN is half urea. So we should lose half as much nitrogen if we're going to lose it through volatilization, leave it on the surface. And that's what we generally do when we're side dressing uh, corn, I, I mean, we do inject if we can, but that's really slow process. So most growers just want to plow it on the surface, drive on. Man, I could, like you would say, half in that study, urea, 130 pounds of nitrogen, side dressed or top dressed at B13, so 13 leaf corn, that's pretty big corn, 40 pounds loss out of 130 pounds applied. That's like 25 percent a quarter of your nitrogen blows Oof. off into the atmosphere right exactly poof gone and like you paid for that nitrogen it's doing you no good whatsoever and it's so really interesting so they stabilized it with a urease inhibitor and when they did that they dropped it from 40 pounds to 14 pounds so that's way better improvement than what we we normally say we we get you know about a 50 percent reduction in loss so that's even better than that but the scary thing in that study is that it took three inches of rain in order for that urea on the surface to get moved into the soil enough that the loss stopped and we've always said half an inch of rain if we get a half an inch of rain but i talked to josh about this a little bit josh Naselski, and he said what he thinks going is going is going on is that the corn plant at that stage is so big and it generally tends to funnel the rain with its leaves and the rain funnels and goes down at the base of the plant. Top-dressed urea 
a fair bit of it is in between the row because the leaves kind of mm. it hits the leaves, rolls off, drops in the center of the row. So we didn't get enough moisture in the center of the row until we got three inches of rain to move that urea in and stop that loss. Hey, the upside of this story, Sean, and and I think it's going to drive different decisions for growers now that we have this information. I think it's really critical research. If we use UAN untreated, dribble banded on top of the soil surface, it was a 10 pound per acre loss, one quarter of the urea, not a half, like not 50% the way we expected, a quarter. And if I put on 130 pounds and I lose 10 pounds, I mean, I don't want to lose any, but that's that's fairly tolerable, right? That's a $7 yeah. and a stomach loss. That. Right, exactly. If I stabilize it, I went from 10 pounds to seven pounds loss. So not nearly the difference in stabilizing it because not nearly the loss to begin with, but really, really, uh, I know, crucial information for growers that I think needs to get out there and growers need to know about. And so now my standard recommendation, if you're top dressing with urea, I've had this discussion probably 10 times since that research came out. You are, you, if you're top dressing urea, you stabilize it. Full stop. No questions asked. You have to. Uh, quickly, Pete, a uh, minute left. What, how, what percent would be stabilized already? Like, is, is this something that's extremely not common? Uh, five years ago, almost zero. Uh, today, quite a bit more. I would have guessed, you know, probably 50%, uh, but still not close to 100%. And, and yeah, this, this is going to make it, it better with urea. It better be 90 or 100%, full stop. Yep. Well, this is why we do research, right? A- absolutely. And it's why we talk about it on Real Ag Radio so that people know about the research and can act on it. <laughs> You got it. A good promotion. You're you're good at that. It, you're you're a natural for this whole extension thing. It's it's uh, it's it's real. It comes by you naturally. Hey Pete, uh, thanks a lot for joining us. Really appreciate it. Hey, no worries, Sean. Always fun, and uh, hope to talk to you next Monday, man. Absolutely. Hey, go Oilers. Go Oilers. Uh, <laughs> Pete, I mean, you may not be back next Monday. Um, remember everybody, a new episode drops of Wheat Pete's Word every single Wednesday where Pete answers your agronomic questions. Okay, we've got more coming up here on Real Ag Radio. We've got conditions in Western Canada that are perfect for aphinomyces. How do you identify it and what do you do about it? Be joined by Megan Reed of SPG right after this. How's your seed quality? What should you treat with? What about herbicide carryover and environmental concerns? Spring is here, and you've got a lot of things to think about in regards to your pulse crop. The Pulse School on Real Agriculture has information and advice for all these questions and more to help you navigate this season. Brought to you by BASF. Pulse School episodes are available at pulseschool.com, realagriculture.com, or as a podcast on your favorite streaming service. Download the latest episode today. I'm Lindsay Smith from realagriculture.com. Join me Monday nights for The Agronomist, a one-hour live and interactive show broadcast across YouTube, Facebook, and X. Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, I host expert agronomists from all over the country to give you answers to some of the toughest agronomic questions. Join us live or catch the replay Tuesday morning. That's The Agronomist with me, Lindsay Smith, Monday nights live at 8 p.m. Eastern. One of the diseases you think we've really set the stage for here in 2024 is is aphinomyces and other types of root rots because you know you think about Western Canada, cool, wet, and and so that's you know kind of the thriving environment. Uh, recently, Real Agriculture's Amber Bell, Alberta field editor, had a chance to catch up with uh, Saskatchewan pulse growers, and Amber had a chat with Megan Reed. And, and really want to talk about identification, proper identification, so you kind of know what you got to do. And one of the issues here is this isn't just a one-year thing. This is a decision or a identification that impacts rotation years going forward. So let's hear what they had to say. 
I am here today with Megan Reed, who is one of the agronomy managers with Saskatchewan Pulse Growers. And we're going to talk about aphanomyces and root rot, which is one of her specialties. So thanks for joining us today, Megan. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's very, very wet. My car actually almost got stuck <laughs> on the road. Yeah. So uh, it's a great time to be talking about aphanomyces, I think. It is, yeah. So um, we're in a pea field right now. And if you can see throughout the video here in the background behind us, there's quite a bit of standing water. The road has standing water and our soil is saturated to say the least. We're definitely right. mud. Muddy and that's the perfect condition for to start these root rots growing, right? Yeah. So root rot, you're, you're talking specifically about aphanomyces, but we typically uh, refer to root rot as a complex because there's more than just one pathogen. Um, so we've got aphanomyces, that's the real big ugly one that we talk about the most. Um, then we also have a number of different fusarium species, rosectonia, pythium, and all of those different pathogens will set in in conjunction with one another um, at different times throughout the growing season or in the spring particularly. Um, but we tend to call them a complex because one will set in and it just opens the door for the others to move in mm. afterwards. And that's one of the things we see particularly with aphanomyces and fusarium is that we don't really know which one comes first. They typically are always present together. Okay, so chicken or the egg scenario. Yeah, right a little bit, yeah. yeah. So gearing into aphanomyces a little bit more, what environmental conditions does it like? Like obviously we're out in a very wet field and it's a good condition for it, but what, what else does it like? Yeah, so Thanomyces specifically, um, when we talk about that pathogen, looking at the disease triangle. So when you have the disease triangle, you need to have all three of those factors satisfied. So you need a pathogen, a host, and the right environment. And so if we take this field, for example, we have purely saturated soil. We have a host crop, which is a pea or lentil. They're equal for susceptibility. And then I haven't confirmed in this field whether there's a Thanomyces here, but mm, we could go out on a limb and say possibly, probably. Um, conditions specifically though, when we talk about the environment, saturated soil, we tend to find it's worse where there's heavy clay and compaction. Um, fields that don't drain well, so water pooling and sitting like we're seeing here. Um, also a really tight rotation. So the more inoculum you have built up in the soil with the phanomyces, it compounds. It's like compounding interest. Every time you grow that host crop, you're going to add to that that inocul inoculum level. Um, Athanomyces particularly will, we see it really rearing its head and seeing symptoms uh, when soils hit about 22 to 27 degrees Celsius. And they love, it really loves uh, pH between four and a half and six and a half. So most of our soils in the province are neutral, but our topsoils are tr tending now to be a little bit slightly acidic, just below neutral. And that's due to a, a number of factors, fertilizer stratification, but um, just slightly acidic. Honestly, if we have heavy clay, saturated soils, tight rotations, um, it's the perfect environment for a phanomyces to, okay. to thrive. To yeah. start seeing it. Yeah. Okay, so how does that compare to other root rots? Are they similar in what environmental conditions they like? Yeah, there's lots of similarities. Um, the biggest one we typically see is moisture. Lots of our the diseases in the root rot complex uh, will activate or, or release spores when moisture levels hit a certain certain point. Um, Pythium, for example, is a neomycete, so this, the same type of pathogen as the category that a phanomyces falls into, so it's not a true fungi. It's what we call an oomycete or a water mold. Um, so Pythium, we typically see that really early in the growing season. Um, seed that goes down untreated, they can just rot away in the seed beds because it's cold and it's wet. Mm -hmm. So those are the conditions that Pythium really enjoys. Fusarium, there's a number of different species that we have. So Avenacium, Redolins, Oxysporum, Solani. And depending on the species or the strain, there's slightly differing um, conditions that it prefers. But again, uh, cool, wet soils. Some prefer warm, wet soils, but wet is still the, common, de yeah, the common denominator. And then another one, the other pathogen that we see in the complex is Rosectonia. So um, typically, lots of guys are really familiar with Rosectonia as wire stem in canola. So Rosectonia likes warm and wet, followed by dry. So we typically see in canola, for example, that stem pinching and just the roots turning to a thread or the stem turning to a thread. Um, one condition start to dry up a little bit later. So you typically see it a little bit later in the, or in the, the spring as well. And 
kind of at the same time as we're seeing Athanomyces symptoms really show up visibly in the field without having to dig up any plants. So when you look at the, the range of conditions, it's really wet. Yeah, wet, <laughs> but right from the onset of seeding to when you're starting to make decisions about fungicide timing, all of those conditions that we experience in the spring at any given point could be conducive to any one of those pathogens activating and setting in. Okay, so the pathogens are in the soil already. Yeah, some are, some are seed-borne, soil-borne. Uh, most of them have residue-borne as well, so they'll hang up on the residue. Fusarium, Resectonia. Um, Thanomyces is not seed-borne. It's soil-borne, and it moves with the way the water flows, which is when you look across the field, you can see some lighter, it's a little bit hard today, but lighter green areas or yellowing off areas, and mm -hmm. then other parts of the field that are a nice, rich, dark green. Water molds will, will swim with the soil water once it reaches saturation level, and so it will move with however the water flows throughout a field. Okay, and this is at a fairly, fairly early stage of the crop right now. Um, so what do you see as the crop goes through its stages? As the infection progresses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, standing here today, Emily and I were here, my summer student, a couple days ago, and we're just starting to see some lesions on the hypocotyl or on the stem. Just starting to see some browning off of some root systems. Um, as that progresses, with Athanomyces in particular, you'll see no nodulation. Nodules won't form or set in. This is about the time that we should start seeing nodules starting to fix nitrogen. Um, visibly, you'll see these yellow, these lighter areas get yellower. They'll be mm -hmm. stunted. They'll start to become chlorotic and die off. And if we dug those plants up, you would see that those classic honey brown roots, no nodules. And if there's fusarium there, which I'm going to pet money there is. <laughs> um, you'll see blackening of the stem or the hypocotyl, which is really classic for fusarium. And if you split that stem open, it'll often have a red or purple cortex. So the center of the stem where the nutrients flow mm. will start to turn red or purple. And that's really diagnostic of a fusarium infection. And okay. often we'll see them together. So you'll get honey brown roots and a black stem. And you can go on a limb and say, you know what, we probably have both here. Right, right. Okay, so a farmer comes out into their field and notices that this is happening. Um, what are their next steps? Is there something they can do about it? And is it going to differ in wet versus dry years? Yeah, so for this grower, for example, in 10 days or so, these symptoms are really starting to show up. Um, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do in season. It is what it is. Um, but if you wanted to confirm what was actually here, and particularly important for Phanomyces, mm -hmm. because that inoculum, is, it compounds, it builds every time there's a host and the conditions are right. Fusarium resectonia, um, those diseases will infect the other crops in our rotation. So we're never getting away from them, mm -hmm. and it's kind of a, a non-starter. Um, there are other management practices or tools that are available for guys to manage those diseases, but with Phanomyces, it's really challenging. So what I would recommend is that a grower come out take a plant sample if it's in season and send those roots and get the roots. <laughs> That's important, not just the above ground parts because the disease is in the roots and send it away to one of the commercial labs we have available to do a DNA extraction and to just identify and confirm, yes, you have a phanomyces. Yes, you have fusarium. This is the species. And from there, it becomes a planning tool for the following year or for years out. If you have any feedback on today's program, we'd love to hear from you. You can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also find us across all the different social media platforms, or you're more than welcome to call the Real Ag Feedback Line. That number is 855-776-6147. Make sure you tune in to The Agronomist tonight while you're watching the Panthers-Oilers game or maybe the College World Series. We'd love to have you join us. 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Central on the Real Agriculture YouTube channel or at realagriculture.com slash live. Thanks, everybody, for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Radio. Chat again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody.